theme for today is declare his praise. Declare his praise. We understand that praise is a reaction to what God has done for us. And sometimes we shouldn't wait for God to do something for us, but we should praise him in advance. Because God you serve, he's cooking something up for you. So keep it with the theme of today and declare his praise. I would like to invite you to take your Bibles and let's go to the book of Psalm, chapter 30, verses 11 through 12. And the Bible says in Psalm chapter 30, verse 11 and 12, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. One of the tags of this text is simply entitled it from tragedy to triumph. Pray with me, God Almighty, hide me behind your cross, that I may not be seen and heard, but that you will be seen and heard. Lord, as we declare your praise, we thank you because you are already turning our mourning into dancing. And take all our tragedies and turn them into triumph. And so we thank you for hearing this prayer. Hide me, Jesus. We ask this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Worship without music is an oxymoron in the African American church. In African American churches, improvisation in the music and participation by the congregation combine to create an experience of God's presence that can heal a broken heart, comfort a weary soul, empower an exhausted spirit. You see, the links between music and worship run deep from biblical times to the present. The ancient psalmist reminded the community to praise God with songs, shouts, musical instruments, raised hands, loud voices, dance, and even in silence. You see, worship through the ages affirms the integral connection between God and humanity. It is my understanding that people enter the sanctuary looking for hope and encouragement in the midst of the joys and sorrows of everyday life. It is incumbent on the music ministry to address the full gamut of spiritual needs. Because after all, people come to church for two things, a good word and some good music. And if the food can be added, that would be a bonus as well. Because music ought to lift you, music ought to change you, music ought to inspire you, music ought to draw you closer to your maker and acknowledge that God is. God is water when I'm thirsty. God is strength when I am weak. God is a way out of the way. God is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. Why? Because God is my all and all. See, music... God's most, God music is God's most mysterious creation, given to humans to evoke emotion that run deeper than the oceans. Music ought to resemble the soul soliloquy when ordinary words can't suffice. Music ought to be harmonious, serendipitous, audacious, glorious, efficacious, ubiquitous, contagious, luxurious, illustrious, and glorious as well. But lately, music that defines our lives in this country has not been symphonic. But if we're honest with ourselves, not all the music that we hear are smooth, melodic notes. No, our lives have been hijacked by hard, clashing, discordant notes. Because of music that does not always translate into something beautiful. Because we have had to experience some diminished chords in our life. Yes, music that's not pleasing to the ears. Music that sounds like this, if you will, the loss of a job instead of a promotion. Music that sounds like, I'm sorry, but the test results are not positive. Music that sounds like your child isn't living up to their potential. Our music has turned into the blues. Yes, we have all had those days or moments in our lives when we have gone from symphony to cacophony. And isn't it amazing that on August 28th last week, it marked the 53rd anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I have a dream. And yet we are still waiting for that dream to come true. Because the sad reality is that although he dreamed, we are still living in a nightmare. Although we listen to the speech over and over, we tend to overlook a powerful statement that Martin makes in that speech. He says, with this 
faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. I mean, can you hear Mr. Martin's blues as he so eloquently captured the idea in our still yet to be United States of America that our faith can take us from jangling discords into a beautiful symphony, but instead of symphony, we have cacophony. What is cacophony? Let me break down cacophony for you. According to Webster's Dictionary, cacophony simply means unpleasant sounds or harsh or discordant sounds. It is when when musical notes are clashing against each other instead of working with each other. As one preacher would put it, cacophony sounds like hell to the ears. It is something disturbing. It is just bad. It is just awful and terrible. And I'm going to hang out here for a few moments because a lot of you have had to deal with some cacophony, hellish things inside of your ears. Constant cacophony. As a matter of fact, if you turn on the TV, there is a certain orange politician that whenever they speak, it sounds like hell to my ears. There's nothing new but hell to my ears. I mean, ain't it crazy when you turn on the news, you hear hell inside your ears. Ain't it crazy how Kaepernick is being trampled upon by the media because he sat down during the national anthem. He chose to exercise his first amendment right, which is freedom of speech. But this is the part that's crazy to me because Kaepernick sits and he is vilified for basically saying that America is in but Trump is glorified for saying America isn't great. Don't you see the cacophony of notes that we have in here? Colin Kaepernick is basically saying America is not great as it was. But Donald Trump can stand up and say America is not great and thousands of people listen to him. This is the cacophony that we're dealing with. Isn't that crazy? Let me break down the word crazy for you. We find that the word crazy is from a Latin word and it's a original definition means that it is full of cracks. Crazy means full of cracks. And we live in a world with a crazy ideologies and crazy ideas that produce crazy people that put them into leadership positions. And our world that we are living in is full of cracks because we got crazy people who are leading out. As a matter of fact, I heard a story about how a mental asylum would determine, would determine how they would release somebody from their asylum and what they would do is they would lock the person inside of a room and they would turn on the faucet and they would stop the drain and they would lock the person inside of the janitorial room turn on the faucet and lock the drain and the water would be flowing out and so when they go back inside of the room they would check to see what the individual was doing which would determine if they were crazy or not and if they saw the individual trying to mop up the floor, they would say, you are crazy and you need to go back to your room. Because an intelligent person would realize the most important thing is to turn off the faucet so that the water does not overflow, but a crazy person would try to mop up the floor. Let me bless you real quick. What we have in our world today are crazy people who have been left outside of the asylum and instead of stopping the faucet of injustice that is causing the problem, they continue to try to mop things around and they're killing the things to up. And so this is the crazy world that we are living. Crazy, cacophony, tragedy, discordant notes, dirge, darkness, the blues are some of our descriptive definitions that we deal with every day. And so our sermonic focus takes us to the book of Psalm chapter 30. As we observe David's poetic pen, and the psalm is known as the blessedness to answer prayer. And David is giving God thanks because David realizes that God has been a mighty good God to him. Why is David praising? We got to understand the context of the text so we don't get conned by the text. And so as I did my study, I realized when David wrote this song, it is known that David wrote this song after the Lord spared him from making a bad decision in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. You see, if you read the chapter, you would remember in chapter 21 of 1 Chronicles that David took a census. And David took that census. And the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 21 that Satan arose up against Israel and caused David to take a census. 
And David, why did he take a census? Was because David wanted to know how many warriors he had so that he could be ready to fight. You see, God was displeased and told David, why in the world are you putting faith in numbers instead of putting faith inside of me? And so David was counting the soldiers and the Lord was displeased with David's actions in 1 Chronicles 21. And I'm going to hang out here and park here parenthetically because it's crazy to me how people will put their faith and trust in things instead of putting their faith in an almighty God. How they will figure that it's because of what they have it makes them who they are. They are so caught up in this and that. My rims, my car, my weed, my her, my nails, my house, my job, and my shoes. And I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Well, excuse me, Miss Foo Foo, a few years ago you didn't have no boots or no straps to pull yourself up. But it was all be because of the Lord our God. Because you didn't get this far by your car. You didn't bring out yourself out of trouble by your bank account. But if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I didn't know if I would have been here today. Do I have a witness in this church right here, right now? And so David was caught up in what he had in front of him and around him instead of acknowledging what he had inside of him and above him. So David was focused on the outside. Not only that, David says that the Bible called that, that, not only that, but the Bible says that Satan caused David to take the census. You all know there are a lot of times when we do things that are prompted by our own selfish desires and passions, but then there are times when that old snake, that old serpent, that old devil will get inside of your ear and make you do things that you never thought you would have done before. Yes, the devil will cause you to say things and that you have never said before. And the devil, when you speak, the devil will speak to you when you think that you got it all under control and the devil will make you do some things. Yes, we can sit up in here and act all holy, but the devil will make you act a fool up in here, up in here, up in here, and the devil has had you in some pits, and David listened to the devil instead of giving ear to God, and as a result of David listening to the devil, as a result of David's foolishness, God said, David, you got three choices. God said you can choose your punishment, and God is like a parent, and I don't know some of you that grew up in the old school, that some of you have parents, they would tell you, you can pick your punishment right now. You can pick a belt, or you can pick a switch, or you can go up in your room, and if you're so confused, you don't know what to do with yourself, you're like, should I take a switch, or should I take a belt? I don't know what to do, then you take so long to make your decision, your mama just make a decision for you, and wear that body out. But God is like a parent. God says, David, you're going to have a choice. You're going to pick which one you're going to tell. And now the Lord tells Gad that these are your choices, David. Three years of famine, three months of destruction by your enemy's swords, or three years of severe plague, three days of severe plague. And look at David. David's pride won't allow him to succumb to destruction by his enemies, but because he is a mighty warrior. And so David does this. He decides to spare himself and the embarrassment, and he says, let the Lord set a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 people died as a result. Go back. Let's look at this. David said, I don't want to be embarrassed by foes coming in to kill me, but God kill the children of Israel so that I can stay alive. And the Bible says that the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 people died as a result. And then when you continue to read in chapter 1, the Bible says that God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But just as the angel was preparing to destroy it, the Bible says that the Lord relented and said to the angel, stop, that is enough. Let me break this thing down. The Message Bible translates the same verse as God saying he compassionate changed his mind that even though David said send the plague to kill the people God said no I got compassion on them I can't see my children die or to suffer with them and I looked up the word compassion and the word compassion means to suffer with somebody I'm going to break this thing down so in other words when the Lord saw his children suffering by the hand of the plague he too was suffering and could not deal with the problem anymore 
about you, but the God you serve will see you through your problem. He will go with you through your problem. He will make himself available and he will conquer that which you are going through and give you a testimony because you do know the 